My name is R. Crosby Lyles, and this is News from the Can. One thing you always gotta remember is take the fucking camera off standby. <laughs> okay, so let's talk, shall we? <laughs> Get this goddamn thing together. Okay, this is one of my favorite YouTubers out there, Joe Scott, with his Answers with Joe series on YouTube. In this video, titled Moore's Law is Ending, Here's Seven Technologies That Could Bring It Back to Life, Joe talks about why Moore's Law is winding down. Cut to Joe Scott. There's a growing concern that Moore's Law may have reached its limit. In fact, some people say that we're already at the end of it. In fact, research shows that processor speed has kind of leveled out in recent years. So why the slowdown? What are these limits we're running into here? One problem is simply heat. The more processing a chip is doing, the more electricity is flowing through it, and that gets hot. Like, melt your computer hot. The other biggie is size. Because once those gates get down to a certain size, the quantum world starts to take over. Thanks to quantum tunneling, electrons tend to just kind of jump the gap whenever they feel like it. Which is a problem in a binary system where it has to be totally on or totally off. Well, that's a bummer, because I'm not getting any younger, and I want to see the singularity, people. Come on, chip chop. Luckily, there are some major advancements in the works that might keep this exponential train going. What he's ultimately saying about the quantum world taking over below a certain size limit is essentially true. But the overall reason is simpler than that, and ultimately much easier to predict. As the size of a transistor gate gets smaller, the electric field becomes larger until the operating voltage exceeds the breakdown voltage of the gate material. So, electron tunneling? Yeah, sure. But it's really the massive electric field generated by having two charged plates in such close proximity that drives the process. Now this is the basic architecture of a field effect microtransistor. The blue material is an insulator between the gate conductor, the source and drain conductors, and the semiconductor material. When the gate is charged, it pulls charge carriers into the gate and allows current to flow between the source and drain. <sighs> Read that fast, motherfucker. <coughs> if the gate width is too small for the operating voltage, the electric field can exceed the breakdown limits of the insulator between the gate conductor and or a substrate between the source and drain, rendering the logic units unable to store a charge and thus retain memory. Heat is generated from the friction of electrons being dragged through smaller and smaller conductor paths. The smaller the wire, the greater the resistance. Can we get that stuff together? You know what I mean? Joule heating is a function of resistance times current squared. The smaller the microcomponent, the greater the resistance and the higher the heat, which exacerbates integrity problems of all kinds. There are a few different kinds of micro devices found deposited on a chip. However, how exactly CPUs function and memory units work is beyond the scope of this video. Links and sources are in the description for further reading. Okay, so basically, if we take two charge plates with, say, three volts between them and place them at one meter's distance from each other, that's an electric field of three volts per meter. If we place the plates at one centimeter, the electric field goes up to 300 volts per meter. If we place them at one micrometer, that's 3 million volts per meter. Typical gate width 17 years ago when I was still in the field were 0.5 nanometers, which yields about 6 billion volts per meter. So it's easy to see the nature of the limits of miniaturization without going to solid state physics. You could get an electron to tunnel through Superman's underwear with six billion volts per meter on hand. Having laid out the reason for the demise of Moore's Law, Joe then goes into all possible new directions that can be taken to keep Moore's Law going with exponential performance improvements year after year. And that's all well and good. But as far as you and me and most average folks are concerned, the gigahertz CPU and network clock speeds that are currently available are actually more than we may ever need. Frankly, if it wasn't for all the spyware and other bloated software bullshit on every device out there, everything you wanted to do, save rendering video, would be done instantaneously. That means no waiting. Five years ago, my mother got a used Dell desktop computer that was years old when she got it. It had Windows XP on it, which gives you an idea of how old it was. The minute we booted it up, it was lightning fast. No waiting. Unfortunately, 
someone got the bright idea of putting a McAfee antivirus program on it. Side note, McAfee is owned by Gordon Moore's Intel. Subsequently, Mom's old computer turned into a boat anchor that doubled as an ashtray. Just in case you might be thinking that Moore's Law was behind the poor performance of your device, think again. If you want to get a good idea of where we as a species actually are, technologically speaking, just watch any science fiction movie, anything from Alien Franchise will do, and most often it will highlight the promising technology from the era the movie was actually made. Alien 1 laughably shows CRT monitors with lines of ones and zeros scrolling down them. Alien 2 shows integrated military command and control combat insertion from space, while Prometheus shows things like 3D holographic conference calling and robotic triage and surgery. But also consider that Star Wars showed a 3D hologram back in the 70s, while Logan's Run, also from the 70s, also had robotic surgery. Am I saying that those technologies were available way back then? Yes, I am, clearly. My point is, the strangely miraculous slow poke technology we're all fiddling around with now is old news to the masters of our collective universe. The NSA has been able to track, record, decipher, and store every electronic signal that emanates from planet Earth since as far back as the late 70s. So in a word, Moore's Law. And since Moore worked for Intel, the owners of the McAfee abomination that destroyed the usability of my mother's only desktop computer, can too. I should state real quick that Gordon Moore is still with us. He's 88 years old and sitting on $7 billion of Intel money. So yeah, good show, old chap. <laughs> really? We have more than enough technology to solve all the world's problems. The bad news for you and me is those problems are currently being solved one at a time as you watch this video. Overpopulation and overconsumption are killing the planet. The simple solution is to allow wealth to concentrate to the point that the vast majority of the population just withers out of existence. Our major planetary concerns will be wiped out by poverty and disease in a few short generations as the super rich harness the technology to survive without us. First they drain your self-esteem, then they drain your hope. Finally they drain your life's blood at some menial dead-end job that you have to work to barely survive. And it probably isn't much you can do about it. Because your consciousness has already been roped and tied by programs operating quietly in the background of the ubiquitous electronic slave maker in your hand. Well, that's about all for today. My name is R. Crosby Lyles, and this has been News from the Can. Thanks for watching. See ya. Thank <laughs> you.